I am so excited to listen to our next speaker, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, Leila Jana is an author and founder and CEO of Samosource and Luxme. Both companies are aiming to give work to low-income people around the world using cutting-edge social enterprise models. A freelance agreement that tend to more than double these people's wages. Welcome, Leila. So interesting to hear more about this. Yeah. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right. We had some issues with the slides up there, so hopefully you'll see our slide deck in a minute. Any luck? <laughs> Okay, well, in the meantime, I will just introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Lila, and I'm coming in from New York and San Francisco. And we started uh, my enterprise, my first enterprise, Samasource, 10 years ago um, as the first uh, data services company in East Africa that was serving international clients. And the mission of Sama, as you will hopefully very soon learn, is to connect low-income people to the internet and provide alternative revenue streams. On average, actually, our latest... Um, our latest quarterly impact report, we publish our impact reports quarterly alongside our financials, showed that on average we're able to increase people's incomes by 500% over the baseline and keep them there for three years after they leave Samasource. Uh, we just went through our first impact audit with um, Yale-based Dean Carlin's group, Impact Matters. They're now doing third-party impact auditing, and we published that report on our website. But it's pretty compelling data that shows the impact of the digital economy. All right, thanks to the team back there. I gave them a tricky job to do this in PDF instead of PowerPoint, so now we have a deck. So if there's one message that you take away from my talk, um, congratulations, it's here, so you can go off and have coffee if you need to. <laughs> it's just um, that giving work, we believe, is a very powerful way to address poverty and all of the downstream effects that are rooted in poverty. If we address work and increase people's incomes, we automatically have an effect on all of those other uh, all of those other issues that we care about so dearly. So let's talk a little bit about our work. Next slide, please. Almost. There we go. <laughs> so we care about poverty uh, mostly because of what it results in, right? You guys are probably familiar with these statistics, but issues like maternal mortality, we still are seeing 300,000 women die each year in childbirth, uh, close to a billion people living without access to clean water, and two and a half billion people without sanitation or toilets. And to give us a sense of what uh, these people look like, next slide, please. Um, this is a young man that I met a few years ago named Ken Kihara in Mathari, which is a slum in Nairobi in Kenya. And this was Ken with his little daughter, Rosaline, outside of his home, a uh, thatched home that he built himself in the slum. Now, Ken was supposed to represent a success story because he'd actually graduated from secondary school from one of the top boarding schools in Kenya and can speak and read and write the, king's, uh, the queen's English. He's incredibly literate. And so you would imagine that someone like Ken in this environment would be able to find a job. That's the whole point of our massive public investment in education. And yet, Ken was forced to leave secondary school and go back to the slum, next slide please, and make his money the way that so many young people have to make their money in developing countries, which is in the informal economy. We still live in a world in which one billion people eke out a dollar a day, that's purchasing power adjusted, by doing informal work. So they are working full time, and yet they're not really counted as workers, and they're not paid living wages, and they're often doing things like what you see here. This is actually what Ken was forced to do after finishing secondary school, which was to go back to the slum and earn just over a dollar a day, brewing a local form of moonshine called Chang'a, and selling it to other people in the slum. This is literally mixed with kerosene and sold on the side of the street. It's called jet fuel locally. And Ken told me that people in the slum drink it to forget themselves. Now, when we took this photograph a few years ago, I interviewed one of the other young men who was brewing Chang'a, who happened to have started a degree program in computer science in a Western Kenyan university. 
So this is what low-income people, even educated low-income people, are relegated to. Now, our typical answer to this problem is charity. We think this is such a terrible issue. What if we build a well in that community? What if we put a school in that community? What if we give away free shoes so that at least they're, they're not barefoot? And that model really started with the traditional model of aid, which interestingly in the US began with Europe after World War II. Uh, during the Marshall Plan era. That's when many of our biggest aid organizations got started, was to help Europe get, to get back on its feet after World War II, which is hard for many Americans of my generation to understand because we think of Europe as this Disneyland full of castles and <laughs> wealth. We don't think of it as a war-torn region, but that was the original function of aid. It was originally intended to be a temporary stopgap, not a long-term solution in many of these economies. Next slide, please. And so since, uh, since we started this model, we've invested roughly a trillion dollars of development-related aid in sub-Saharan Africa alone from the wealthy world, and yet we've not seen a huge improvement in the real per capita incomes of the poorest people. So we have to question whether this model, at least the traditional government-to-government -government aid transfer model, is working, and I believe there's ample evidence now that there is a better solution. This is not to say that aid is over or aid is dead. There are many applications where I think aid makes sense, but for long-term development, we need to think about how we boost low-income people's household income, right? How do we see an immediate and measurable boost in the household income of the poorest people. And that, I believe, is how we should be measuring our aid efficacy. Are we actually making poor people less poor? We know that when we do that, they tend to spend their money on all of the right things. Next slide, please. And so our argument is let's move away from that traditional government-to-government -government transfer model and wherever possible, use a social enterprise model to give work. We now see ample evidence that when we improve household incomes, we see exactly the sorts of investments we would want to see in the best aid program. We see that when we invest in low-income women, they reinvest 90% of their paychecks back in the health, education, and well-being of their children and family members and community. We even see a healthier relationship between people and their government. Once people start earning living wages and getting taxed, there is a stronger social contract between people and government, and even if that is far from perfect, I believe it's really important for people to demand accountability once they start paying taxes, right? All of a sudden, they become visible to the state. And this is a much healthier relationship that you see in many Western countries that many former colonial countries have been deprived of. And there's now more and more political science that's confirming uh, that this link between taxation and at least the perception of accountability is, is stronger than we think. So this is a further argument that when we give work, when people start earning wages and become formally part of the tax system, they become counted for the first time as citizens who have a voice. And I think that relationship is incredibly important. Next slide. So there is a new way of work, of working in 2018 that simply didn't exist two decades ago and certainly didn't exist when the aid model started. And that's facilitated by massive growth in the internet, uh, in internet capabilities and in the lower cost of computing. This is an image of me with a spool of fiber optic cable in northern Uganda. When people say the internet is rolling out across Africa, this is literally what it looks like in these big cables. This was taken back in 2012. And since then, over 10,000 miles of fiber optic cable have reached up even into the hinterland of northern Uganda, which is an area that's not known for high-speed internet. It's known mostly to Westerners as the seat of a brutal civil war. And that means that there's an entirely new type of work that's available to people like Ken. This doesn't always impact people who are illiterate or people who have zero access to any uh, computing power, but it certainly can work for people who finish secondary school. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you an example of this type of work. This is an image, and next slide. This is an annotated version of this image. Does anyone have any idea what this might be used for? An image annotation. This is one of the fundamental inputs for self-driving car technology. In order to train an algorithm how to drive, how to make decisions about what is a stop sign or what is a tree or what is a lane line, we have to train it. 
much the same way that we train a toddler how to differentiate between a tree or a shrub, right? Or how to know when to stop before crossing the street. And to train a computer the same way that you train a human, you need lots of examples. You need a lot of what is called training data. And so there is a huge, huge need for this kind of image annotation. The person who leads artificial intelligence at Tesla, a young rock star computer scientist from Stanford, has said that image labeling, data labeling, is the new programming because there is such a massive appetite for this in artificial intelligence. And you can imagine that there's a need for this sort of what's called computer vision training data, not just in self-driving car technology, but in shipping and logistics, in biotechnology, in agriculture, where we're now using drone and satellite images to monitor crops from afar without having to send someone there to do testing. We can actually visually identify which crops are failing and which ones are thriving. You can imagine the applications of artificial intelligence are now stretching across every industry. And the biggest need now is for massive amounts of training data, which means there is a need for humans to tag this data. Next slide. And so uh, 10 years ago, we saw the beginnings of this trend with demand for all kinds of offshore services. And I thought to myself, what if I could start a company that would hire people like Ken and employ them in the dig digital economy? And I was really interested in how to make that employment happen without a huge training time. So you've probably seen the growth of a lot of coding programs, software coding, which is wonderful, but not everyone's going to get a software coding job, especially someone who's never had any formal employment, who's never used a computer. However, I can train someone like that to be able to do an image tagging task within a matter of days, and I can train that person over time to do increasingly complex image tagging work that is incredibly valuable to the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. So that was the premise of Samasource. Um, as I started 10 years ago, the term benefit corporation was just emerging, and so we decided to incorporate as a nonprofit, as a 501c3. And next slide. We're now the largest data services company in East Africa, employing about 2,000 people full time. All of the people that we employ come from low-income backgrounds, roughly $2 a day in starting income. And we work with a range of community nonprofits to recruit them. What I think is most remarkable about this model is that now, finally, <laughs> last year, uh, just over uh, eight years in, we became profitable off of our earned revenue because we're able to secure contracts with large technology enterprises. So not only in the, is this model truly scalable, and not only are we serving, I think, some of the most interesting applications in technology, we're able to do this with a marginalized workforce, and we're able to do it profitably. And so for the first time this year, we're opening up the model to <coughs> impact investors, and we've taken on our first impact investment from the Bestseller Foundation, which is uh, here in Scandinavia and in, in Denmark. So. Um, we're looking forward to expanding, but one of the challenges in our field is that we are among many venture-backed technology startups that employ a crowdsourcing model that don't have the same sorts of stringent, uh, fair trade-like labor practices that we do. We, we ensure that all of the workers in our supply chain and in our, in our uh, frontline offices are paid living wages. Next slide. And uh, we've now been able to employ over 10,000 people directly through this model since we started uh, a decade ago, mostly in Kenya and Uganda. And we have also opened an office recently in India, so there's potential for this model to scale. We get asked every day, pretty much, because every government around the world is trying to figure out how to crack this code of digital employment. How can we expand to Malaysia? Or my favorite was we got an email from Kyrgyzstan six months ago and said, can you come to Kyrgyzstan? And um, you probably work with founders. One of the biggest challenges for founders is saying no, especially when social impact is concerned. But we found a way to accommodate some of these interests by setting up a, an advisory services practice. So now we consult with governments and large NGOs and other uh, organizations that are looking to bring a version of this model to their region. And that consulting practice is now operating at a roughly break-even basis. And that's how I believe we can help scale this industry, um, which we pioneered in East Africa, this industry of impact sourcing around the world. Next slide. 
Um, you saw in the previous slide an image of our work center in Nairobi, which is super high tech. It's much nicer than our office in San Francisco. There's like biometric scanning when you enter. And because we serve a lot of these big technology clients, we have to be careful about data security. But what's really cool is that we can also employ this model in northern Uganda. So that photo that you saw uh, of me with the fiber optic cable, that was on the, en route to Gulu in northern Uganda, where we set up a center that was subsidized by the Dutch postcode lottery and became profitable after a few years inside shipping containers. This center now employs over 100 people. We've created employment for 500 people since we started. And these are all very low income, former agricultural workers. So people who lived in families that were doing subsistence agriculture, where one person in the family finished secondary school, wanted to go to university. So we set up this center on the site of Gulu University. And we have young people there who are pursuing their studies at Gulu University and also doing this work to pay for their studies. And what's really exciting is that it's off the grid, it's solar powered. Next slide. <laughs> I want to give you a sense, I still have some time, right? OK, I want to give you a sense of, um, of what it's like for a worker before and after Sama. So workers coming in, and this is based on pretty detailed household survey data that we do on a randomized basis. We actually interview people and find out what they're spending their money on. So pre-Sama, we see that they are typically living in informal housing. That image is actually Ken's uh, first house when it, where I met him where his daughter was playing next to an open sewer. Uh, poor nutrition, that <laughs> image of sugar stands for sugar cane because we find that a number of our workers are getting the majority of their calories from sugar cane before they're able to afford better food. Limited education because of the opportunity cost of going to school and not working. And inadequate health care. Next slide. On average, and this number is now updated as of last quarter, on average, we are moving them 5x over the baseline to over $10 a day. And that number applies on average for all of the workers, over 10,000 people, that we've hired since 2008. So you can imagine there's a dramatic difference in the quality of life, not just for that worker, but on the direct income dependence in the household, typically two young children and an aging parent or two. So immediately they move into safer housing, access healthier food, um, are able to pay for tuition for younger children in the family, and finally get access to health insurance. So it's my view that if we address that root cause of poverty, if we increase the household income, especially doing something in the digital economy where there's a lot of follow-on work potential, we improve a lot of these other issues uh, automatically, right? And people will do that on their own. They don't need us to dictate the terms of their development. Next slide. And so since we started, we've been able to do this for now uh, over 50,000 people. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, model that we've adapted for work in a developed context in the United States. So we set up a program 10 years ago, next slide, uh, called Sama School, which works in a different context. What we found is that in many developed labor markets, particularly in the US, next slide, we see that the majority of uh, employment growth is happening in freelancing. This is a really unique thing in the US. In the last decade, almost all employment growth has not happened in traditional nine to five jobs, but rather in freelancing. And we, yet we're not training low income people to benefit from any of this. We're not teaching them how to make sense of these platforms, how to weed out bad employers, how to earn living wages, how to file self-employment tax. I think this is less relevant probably here in Europe where you have a range of government benefits. In the US, all of your benefits are tied to your employer. Um, if you have them, <laughs> that's a whole other talk we could, we could do. But uh, there's a huge need, I believe, to equip low-income people with the skills to succeed in this freelancing economy. And so, next slide. We developed a program called Sama School to equip low-income people with these skills for platforms like care.com. Uh, there's a huge number of platforms, including uh, one called Field Nation, where you can earn money as an outsourced IT uh, services professional. So you don't need to know coding skills. It's mostly customer service and being able to reference a user manual on the back end. But we found that many people who don't have advanced computer skills can pick up skills required in the freelancing economy very quickly. And we just released, next slide, some powerful data on the benefits of this. So in the US, one in six people lives in poverty. 
on about $23,000 a year for a family of four. And this is the target demographic that we reach with Sama School. We were, after five months, on average, able to improve those incomes by $9,000 in supplemental income. So this is a very big deal. If you're a low-income single mother and you don't have flexibility in your low-wage retail job, this offers you flexibility plus uh, better wages. And this is an example of one of the women who's gone through our training program. So we implement this training through local workforce centers and nonprofits. We've now partnered with the cities of New York and San Francisco, which offer city-level training. This woman is a military veteran who served the country and a single mom, and when she left the service, she had no job coming out of it. And so this is a way for her to pay for schooling while she's also able to, to take care of her son at home. So I think this is a very viable solution. In Europe, we've been exploring this possibility for migrant populations, for people who come here with no you know, formal work lined up, but who might be able to do this work remotely and support themselves while they're, uh, while they're struggling. I'll say one last thing about Luxme and then conclude. So I started a second business because I'm a crazy entrepreneur. Uh, when Sama became profitable, I thought, okay, we've got a, a pretty big leadership team. Um, we have funding lined up. And so I was curious about other ways our give work model might reach different populations. And I was especially interested in people who had not gotten the chance to go to secondary school. So in Northern Uganda, I came across a roadside stall where women were selling a rare form of shea butter called nilotica. This is actually a version of that oil. If you can go to the next slide. Nilotica comes from a rare subspecies of shea tree that only grows wild at the source of the Nile River in northern Uganda and South Sudan and parts of Ethiopia. And it yields a really beautiful, luxurious butter that I started using myself. And I thought, wow. Here I pass through duty free every time I'm in Europe on my way to Africa, and there are $200 skin creams sold at duty free, which contain petroleum based derivatives, endocrine disrupting chemicals. My favorite skin cream when I finally read the label contained yellow number five and red number seven. Many of the ingredients in US high end skincare are banned, thankfully, in Europe, so you couldn't buy them even if you wanted to. So not only are we poisoning ourselves with stuff that's bad for us, but we're also buying these things that are not necessarily good for the world. And the challenge with a lot of the fair trade and organic brands is that they don't always appeal to the luxury consumer. And I thought, what if we could build a vertically integrated company that sourced directly from low-income women's cooperatives in Uganda, but retailed a product at a higher price point that looked luxurious and beautiful so we could get these women who are buying Dior and Chanel skin creams to buy something that's moving the needle on poverty, but not feel like they have to sacrifice. And so out of that, Luxme was born. Um, we became the first fair trade brand to launch nationwide at Sephora in the US, our nation's biggest uh, beauty retailer. And the mission is to promote fair wages in the supply chain, uh, clean skincare, so totally non-toxic formulas, as well as conservation incentives for rare plant-based ingredients like Nilotica. And I really believe that the future for conservation in many of these regions is to tie a financial incentive to keeping certain types of wild assets alive. In the case of Nilotica, these trees were being cut down for firewood, and our local supplier there worked hard to show the local population and the government that these trees were worth a lot more alive than dead, right? Because they can yield a high-end product that women in rich countries are willing to pay a lot for. <laughs> and so that's the premise behind Luxme. And next slide. We try to showcase as much as possible the culture of the region that we're sourcing from, as well as um, go ahead. Uh, the women who are behind the skincare. And in fact, you can listen to interviews of the women who harvest the raw ingredients on our website. So we're trying to create a new level of transparency as well as um, inject this model into luxury skincare. So I think I'm about out of time, unfortunately, but I am really excited uh, to bring our give work model to you. And maybe we can just fast forward to the end so you can see um, my contact information, just a few slides down. Sorry, the clicker didn't work. Um, I just wanted to end by saying that Ken, who you met at the very beginning of the presentation, became one of our top trainers at Sama. He's now trained over 500 people from Mathare and Kibera slums to join our model. And I last connected with him 
in Lebanon, in, in Beirut, where he was leading our first ever pilot program to work with Syrian migrants. So I really believe that this model of giving work can create a different level of empowerment than giving someone a handout or charity because it enables them to dictate their own future. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Leila, so much. What an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, maybe you can ha just answer yeah. one qu oh, sure. question. I know we're late, but in achieving so much, what are you most proud of? Well, I will not say we've achieved very much because the scale of poverty is huge and we are really relatively tiny organizations. Um, so I feel like there's enough room for the next hundred years for us to do a lot of work. But I guess I'm just happy to still be around after 10 years. Um, I think the model of venture capital in Silicon Valley is let's pump as much money as possible into these enterprises and either they're gonna go big or they're gonna go bust. And I think that whole model of very short-term, you know, short-term returns focus has really created bad incentives in the industry. And so I'm really excited that we're still here 10 years later, even though we're a nonprofit. We're still very competitive with great clients. I hope we'll be here 10 years from now and even 10 times as big. So. We do too. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. A little small token for a Thank great. Thank you. Thank you.